Well, good evening. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And this is our Good Friday service. Now, before we start, I just wanted to mention that at the end of this, we will be celebrating the Lord's table. We'll have a moment of communion. And so if that's something that you want to participate in, then I would highly recommend that you pause the video right now and that you go and find something that you can use to uh, have for juice and that you can use for the bread so that you can uh, participate with us at the end of this. Good Friday is about the cross. And we don't really understand cross where we live. We don't have anything like it in our culture. We don't have a form of public execution that combines both shame and torture. Our English word, excruciating, is about as close as we get. That word literally comes from the phrase, out of crucifying. And originally, when Jesus was brought before Pilate, Pilate had wanted to set Jesus free. Before he was condemned, Jesus is beaten. He's whipped by soldiers with glass and leather, and they hope to make an example of him so that they can let him go. Jesus is brought back before a jeering crowd, and he's broken and bruised. Crucify him, the mob shouts to Pilate. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas. A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Pilate releases a guilty man, and he keeps Jesus, and he does this knowing that Jesus is innocent. Why? Well, the text tells us, to fulfill the evil desire of the people. He does it, not because it's right or wrong, but he does it to please the crowd. Verse 32 says, two others who are criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they were crucified and the criminals, one on his right and one on Jesus' left. Crucifixion is the most violent and most cruel form of execution imaginable. Nothing like crucifixion has ever been made before or since. And it's here that our beautiful Savior is unjustly murdered. And not for any sin, because he didn't have any. Remember, Jesus had done nothing wrong. And it's here from the cross, looking down, after having been beaten and nailed to beams of wood, how does Jesus respond? With anger? With threats? with the wrath of God. If I took you by the hand and I said, come and see Jesus, after these 10 weeks of lessons that we've had together and we've been talking about this man's character, what would you expect? What would you expect from Jesus, from the cross? Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus prays, Father, forgive them Father, forgive the ones who are murdering me. From the cross, in his last hours, Jesus is still on brand. He preached love. 
He preached forgiveness, and even here, he doesn't waver. Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And even now, Jesus embodies this command to love your enemies. Have you ever doubted that Jesus loves? Have you ever doubted that Jesus loves you? That all of this, all of this, even, even the cross is an act of love towards you. Because in his last act, Jesus, from the cross, he forgives everyone present. He forgives them all. Why? Jesus loves unconditionally. Jesus loves unconditionally. God is love. The Bible says love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. So for that to be true, Jesus loves. And he loves without cause and he loves without payment. Jesus loves us all no matter what. The most famous Bible verse of all says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Who does God love, according to that verse? The world, right? He doesn't love because we did something. He doesn't love because of anything that we promise. His love is not contingent on us at all. He is not waiting for us. He is not asking of us. He is not requiring anything of us. In fact, he knows us. He knows the real us. He knows us all the way to the core, and yet he loves us anyway. In fact, the Bible says it's actually the other way around. The only reason that we can love is because of God. 1 John 4.19 says we love because he loved us first. Jesus loves them all. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. So what do those words mean? I mean, is he erasing all of their sins? Is he saying the crowd is blameless or that they shouldn't be held accountable? And, and what does he mean that they don't know what they're doing? Of course they know what they're doing. Uh, we're all adults here. It's not like this was an accident. This was a spectacle that was orchestrated. This all was planned. This was carried out. What does Jesus mean they don't know? Do they know they're killing Jesus? Yes. Do they know that he is innocent? Rome did. The Jews, they just want him out of the way. I mean, if we go back to John 11, it says, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. And if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. Jesus was the problem. And they got rid of him. So of course, they knew what they were doing. So what does Jesus mean? John 1 says he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. John says he, meaning God. God came to us and we did not know. Father, forgive them. Withhold your wrath because they do not know that they are killing your son. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Paul writes that the cross is folly, that it's not understood. It's the tipping point for some because they don't understand it. Jesus forgives them all because he loves them all. And then... The Bible says they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. 
The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was an inscription over him that read, This is the king of the Jews. That's a lot of people for Jesus to forgive, right? I mean, did you catch all of that? I don't know how many paintings of the crucifixion that you've seen or how many times you've seen this scene play out in movies or what picture you have in your head, but a crucifixion back then was like a like a WFC title fight. There, there are people there. There's the soldiers, right? Who else is there? Mark 15 says, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So these are just people walking down the road. These are people that are not even stopping. These are looky loose. These are people just walking by and calling out. Jesus forgives them. Who else is there? So also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Can you imagine that scene? I mean, let's say you're at a, a boxing match or you're at a, a, a title fight and your, your pastor is sitting next to you in the crowd and he's shouting out, yeah, kill that guy, smash his face in. Who else is there? Oh, the ones who orchestrated this entire thing, the scribes and the Pharisees. Even though the law forbids them to be around dead bodies, you'd think that they would want to lay low. No, they want to make sure their plot is carried out. They're there too. And Jesus forgives them. Who else is there? Verse 32 says, those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Wow, that's harsh, right? You got three electric chairs and the guys sitting next to you are hurling insults at you as their last words on earth, right? They're using their last breath to curse you. These are the people. These are all the people that Jesus forgives. These are the people whom Jesus loves. And everyone in the scene would say that this man, Jesus, is getting exactly what he deserves. Come and see the cross. Come and see the false prophet, the so-called king of the Jews. Come and see him die. And to you or me, everyone at that scene, I think, deserve God's wrath. None of them deserve Jesus' forgiveness. But the Bible says that that's true of all of us. Romans 3 says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are all under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood and their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. See what's true of this crowd at the cross is true of us. It's true of you and me, which is a good thing that Jesus loves unconditionally. But then there are verses in the Bible that say he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Jesus is also the judge. Here the people are not just executing their Lord or their Messiah or a prophet or a teacher. What they don't know is that they are also killing a judge, killing a righteous judge, a judge who will one day judge them. Revelation 19.11 says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Jesus comes back. He comes back on a white horse, and he's ready to judge, and he says, Hey, everybody! Remember me 
I'm back. <laughs> right? Acts says he's appointed by God. Revelation says he's righteous. That means that not only does Jesus forgive because he loves unconditionally, but he also judges justly. Jesus judges justly. Romans 2.11 says, For God shows no partiality. Which means when Jesus is on the cross and he's looking down over the crowd, it's not just his favorites that he forgives. It's not just his own people or his own disciples. He shows no partiality because he judges justly. But there's still one last person. Here at the crucifixion that, that we haven't mentioned yet, one character that I think is extremely important and whose life gets overshadowed a lot in this moment, and for the rest of our time together, I really want to focus here. Luke 23, verse 39 says, One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. So we mentioned earlier that there's two other criminals being crucified with Jesus, one on his left and one on his right. And one criminal, the Bible says, railed at him. Now, the Greek word there translates as blasphemed. It's literally the Greek word blasphemo, or to speak evil of someone. So this man is also one of the people that Jesus forgives. But what about the other man? Verse 40 says, But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we, indeed, justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. So both criminals are also on a cross. So both are wrongdoers. Both are criminals. Both are found to be guilty. Jesus, because he loves us unconditionally, and not because of our works or our deeds, Jesus loves them both. And as we saw earlier, he forgives them both. But to the second one, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus says this to nobody else. The promise is only for him, one criminal. Why does Jesus say this to one and not the other? One criminal blasphemes. He calls Jesus out. He says hurtful things. And the other criminal says, stop it. One criminal is acting just like the crowd below, acting like everybody else, just like all of Jesus' accusers. And the other criminal, he acts differently. He says, do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. What makes the second criminal different? Well, first he acknowledges his own wrong. He says, you and I are sinners. He knows that he's done something wrong. He admits it. He confesses it. He says, our judgment is just. Our punishment is just. And he says, but this man is not a sinner. This man doesn't deserve to be with us. The second criminal says, I am guilty, but Jesus is not. Let me ask you something. If Jesus is simply a prophet, if he's simply a teacher or a preacher, he's only mortal, he's a human, how can he be sinless? He can't. Romans 3.10 says, None is righteous, no, not one. Is the criminal admitting, acknowledging, confessing that Jesus is more than a man? Is this second criminal making a profession of faith? Verse 42, And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Wow! Wow! This second criminal acknowledges that Jesus has a kingdom. So in order for that to be 
true, Jesus has to be a king. And everyone else is blaspheming. Everyone else is ignorantly jeering. Everyone else is calling Jesus filthy names. And this criminal calls Jesus by name. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Just like the woman at the well. Just like Jairus pleads for his daughter. Just like the woman sick with blood. Just like the man possessed by legion. Just like the blind, the lame, the crippled, and the hungry. Jesus, help. Right? How does Jesus respond to cries for help? How does Jesus respond to cries for mercy? And if I took you by the hand and I said, come and see Jesus, who would I take you to see? I would take you to a God who has time for you, a God who is merciful and just. I would take you to a God who is both lion and lamb. I would take you to our teacher. I would take you to our good shepherd. I would take you to our strength. I would take you to our God. Jesus, help. What is Jesus going to do? He's going to do what he always does. Love. He said to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. What's the lesson here? What are we supposed to learn here? What's the takeaway? When we call on the name of Jesus, we are saved. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. When this criminal cries out for forgiveness, Jesus forgives. And when this criminal confesses kingship and a kingdom, Jesus rescues. And that's good news for us. If that worked for the criminal, then that works for us. Jesus loves unconditionally. Jesus judges justly. And Jesus forgives completely. Notice that the outcome for both criminals is not the same. Jesus only tells one person from the cross that they will be with him in paradise. Both criminals have the same opportunity. They both have the same access to God. But only one receives reward. Only one is shown grace. Are both forgiven? Yes. Everyone there was forgiven. But only one gets grace. Why? Because only one believed. If Jesus is the righteous judge, then he can show no favoritism. He shows no partiality. He loves all the same. God does not change. He is consistent. And in this moment, on the cross, Jesus is willing to forgive everyone there, but only one gets grace. Why? Because only one believed. Only one recognized their sin. Psalm 32 says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity. I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Only one repented. Acts 3 says, Repent therefore and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Only one received grace, because only one asked for it. James 4 says, God opposed the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. John 1.16 says, And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Romans 3.24, And all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Only one believed, 
only one asked, so to only one grace is given. There is sickness in the world. And the Bible says we all have it. We're all contaminated and we all contaminate each other. We're all infected. Nobody is innocent. But at the same time, there is also a cure. There is one, 100% FDA approved cure. But you only get the cure if you ask for it. You apply for it, you schedule it. It's administered to you by God and you receive it, but nobody is gonna force you to take it. I mean, you're free to take your own chances. That's your choice. But the Bible is clear. The cure only works if you take it. If you decide not to take it, Jesus says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation 20, 15 says that if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Only one believed and only one asked. The other criminal on the cross said, no, thank you. And he bore his sin himself. But the other criminal asked for forgiveness, asked for mercy. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, the Bible wants you to know that grace is free. We ask him to forgive us and he does. Ephesians 2 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. See, the lesson we learn from the second criminal is that salvation comes just by the asking, believing in the one who saves and asking. There's no hoop to jump through. There's, there's no work to do. There's no checklist. There's no task. There's no comparisons. There's no measuring up. We do nothing because he does everything. So why this? Why, why Good Friday? What's the point of this service? Why do we keep coming back to this story? Why do we keep drudging it back up and retelling this gruesome scene? Is, is Jesus crucified again and again and again every single time I sin? No. And I think 1 Peter says it best. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. See, the cross costs you nothing, but it costs Jesus everything. What saves you? The precious blood of Jesus. Don't belittle that symbol. Don't trivialize this symbol. It's more than jewelry. It's more than a bumper sticker. It's more than the logo of your church. The cross is where the cost was given. The precious blood of God's Son. And we're going to end our time together with communion. Jesus said that when we gather, we should remember his sacrifice. So he takes the elements of Passover and he says, eat this and drink this. And he says, when you do that, remember me. When Jesus took the bread, he broke it and says, this is my body. Take this, eat this, and remember that my body was given for you. John 6 says, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man 
and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Take, eat, the body of Christ given for you. And then Jesus takes the cup, and he passes the cup around the table, and as he does so, he tells them, drink. This is the blood of the new covenant given for you. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Hebrews 9 says, Indeed, under the law almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. The blood of Christ, given for you, take and drink. Now, this meal doesn't save us. In fact, baptism doesn't save us. Only the grace of Jesus, only what was done at the cross saves us. Don't cheapen this gift. That's the point of Good Friday. Yes, if we continue to sin and we continue in that, and we don't ever give it a second thought, and we act like nothing matters, then, then we're cheapening this act. Something in us is off, and we, we cheapen grace. Good Friday should make us repent. We should recognize the cost that was given for us, and we then make it a habit. Now, I'm not saying that you need to constantly go to God in prayer every single time you sin, but we need to acknowledge our sin. We need to recognize our sin. And we need to be aware of what was given so that our sin could be erased. We have a wonderful gift in the cross. It's where the precious blood of Jesus was spilled for you and for me. Let's pray. Lord, it's on this day that we remember the cross. And sadly, on Good Friday, this is where we leave Jesus. For three days, we leave him here. Our last memory will be of Jesus' death until Easter morning. But that makes Easter morning all the sweeter. That makes the empty tomb all that much more glorious. Because on that day, Jesus will triumph over death. But for right now, our Savior is on the cross, bleeding out and dying and giving his last breath for me. Lord, I don't want the cross to be jewelry or a bumper sticker or even my church's logo. I want it to be everything that you intended. It is my salvation. It is the act and the work that was done by your mighty hand so that I could be free. The cross is the instrument of my grace. It is the instrument of forgiveness. And it was not cheap. It's free to me but it was not cheap to you. It was costly. And so right now I just acknowledge my sin. I confess it. I put it out on the table and I admit it. My wrongdoings, my shortcomings, the way in which I try to control my life and this world without you, the way I act arrogantly, the way I belittle and hurt people around me, the way I don't use my words to glorify you, don't use my actions to bring you glory, the way I selfishly live. Lord, Easter should remind me that it's all about you. Everything. And there's nothing more important. Your son laid down his life because he called us friend. 
your son willingly went to the cross, marched to the cross on the back of a donkey because he loved. He loved the world. Lord, may that be my mandate. May I love the world. Love people who are not like me. Love people who the world says is my enemies. May I love my neighbor and my enemy equally. May I love my family and those around me. Thank you for the blessings of my life. May I show that same love like your son to a world that needs to see love. In a world where it seems that hope and grace and love are fading. May your church and your followers be the light as you are the light. And we look forward to Easter Sunday. We look forward to saying he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And so real quick, I wanted to remind you about Easter morning. Uh, we'll have two services, one at 7 a.m. and one at 9.30. The 7 a.m. service will be at the Yacht Club flagpole, and we will have seating for 200. It's outside, but if you feel like you want to be more socially distant, you can bring your own lawn chair and set it up anywhere you'd like. Following that 7 o'clock service, we will have an Easter egg hunt for the kids, and then we'll all be back here at 9.30 for our second service. That service will also have a full uh, children's program for the kids. So all of uh, our kids, all ages, will be welcome uh, over in our fellowship center, and they will have their own Easter program. And then following everyone's time together, we'll have a second Easter egg hunt out on our church lawn. I hope you have a place to attend and worship this Easter. Uh, our church, Walden Church, would love to be the church where you live. We hope you have a blessed Easter weekend, and we'll see you soon. Bless you.